so we're excited to get started and talk today about the six big trends in accelerating talent development. Uh, Jen and I are both excited to, to be here today, and we're going to introduce ourselves. But before we do, we have our first moment of engagement that we'd like to hear from you. So as we introduce ourselves, I want we would love to understand which category best describes your role in team. I know we are expecting you know, a couple hundred people here today. And I want to make sure that as we curate and have our discussion about these trends that we can, you know, make sure we have our audience in mind and make sure this is a valuable 45 minutes for everybody here today. So we will open up the poll. Please, you know, post in what your, what role that you, you best decide, decide yourself. And with that, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. I am our vice president of customer success here at Learn In. Uh, prior to this, I worked at a, an education technology company called Andela that has now evolved into an engineering services business. And then also before that, I was at IBM. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I was drawn to learn in and to the industry of education, you know, technology and really, you know, accelerating people's careers because I just was so confused that there was just not a logical way to learn in you know, the corporate setting, you know, many years ago when I was at IBM, you know, there was a lot of restrictions on if you wanted to get your MBA or get a, an additional program, uh, then, you know, we, we had the, you had to kind of agree to work with the company for quite a few years to make sure that would happen. And then another company just wasn't prioritized. So I, I found that Learn In was a great way to kind of bring together that common sense approach to learning to make sure what's needed from a business perspective and from an employee growth perspective were really in line. So I'm excited to pass it to Jen, who started as a client of ours, but now has turned into a good friend. And you'll see in our, our, our conversations today that we were very aligned when we were starting to have you know, these macro level conversations about learning and development and how to kind of properly facilitate that in different organizations. So with that, Jen, I'll pass it over to you to introduce yourself. Thanks, Michelle. So hello, everyone. My name is Jen Collins. I am learning consultant and brand director for Learning Cluster Design Group. Essentially, we're on a mission to help learning creators move beyond one and done, one size fits all learning in order to drive lasting impact. My background, I have almost 20 years of business and marketing experience, and the last four years have really been focused in learning and development. And so where my passion lies is really at that intersection of talent development and marketing and how we can make our programs more impactful for our learners. So excited to be here today. Thanks, Jen. Do we have the poll results? Curious to see who's with us today before we dive in. Awesome. HR, L&D, talent acquisition, benefits, DNI, great. Ooh, some other HR, non, other HR job roles, great. Okay, so as we suspected, kind of a good variety here today, but um, it really helpful to understand where everybody's coming from and how to make sure, again, this is super valuable. All right, before we dive in, I just want to give you a, a teaser to what you're going to see in the next 45 minutes. We are going to highlight six trends, as we mentioned, and give you the overview of, of why, we, why we're why we hearing that in the market and what are some things that are happening. But to bring it all together, we're going to leave you in each of these six trends with two or three tactics that you can bring to your team today, tomorrow, if you'd like. So we want it to be very actionable, very tangible for you to actually utilize within your own your own job role and own job scope scope. So at the end of the end of this, we'll ask you to like think about what's that one thing you're going to apply. So just want to foreshadow that. And I would just empower you all to try to participate at least once or twice in either the the word bubble we have coming or kind of the open text poll questions that we have as well, because that'll help you know drive the engagement in the conversation. So that's my my. Uh, my my starting point. So with that, let's start with trend number one, which you can see up here is enabling the modern workforce. So as we were the last couple of weeks, we've been planning this webinar and what to say and trying to think about how to set up this modern workforce. And it was actually, as I was watching the We Crashed docu documentary drama series about WeWork, uh, that it kind of hit me. And 
you know, normally, you know, there's a bit of controversy around WeWork. So I want to be cautious about starting that way. But I will say, you know, Adam Newman had quite the visionary uh, envision for the office. And he had this one line that I wanted to start us off with, because I think it really does kind of start the conversation today. He says, the future of work looks different. There is a new generation out there. They don't dress like their parents. They don't work like their parents. They don't think like their parents. Why would they want their parents' offices? So of course he's referring to the, you know, the in-office experience, but I will just add, you know, the different generations have a different style of learning. None of us learn how our parents learn and we have all different goals and strategies for what we need from a corporate setting. So, you know, just to further this point, you know, the incoming generation, Gen Z to the workforce, the third most important benefit they're looking for in business, in their business or their company that they want to work for is learning benefits. You know, that is up many points, especially after the pandemic and compared to other generations as well. So just want to start us off with that trend. And with that, I'm going to open up a word cloud. So your first engagement moment here of how would you define a modern workforce? So add to the word cloud a couple comments or notes about words that might you might see work or different trends that you've seen in your own workplace that you're doing to make it a modern workforce. But while we wait for those responses to come in, and maybe it'll help you cheat or have some inspiration of what you're going to put there. I'm going to pass to Jen. You know, Jen, you've been working in many different settings, uh, you know, big companies, small companies, et cetera. What do you think a modern workforce looks like? And then, you know, furthermore, what, what do you think happens if companies don't adapt? Yeah, so great question. And I think what was so interesting as we dove into this trend is that essentially it was the overarching umbrella that each of the subsequent trends ladder up to. And so when what I'm hearing and what we're hearing from L&D leaders and HR leaders is that what's modern for one team is is different for another and, and what they need in order to meet their talent needs as well as their business goals may be a little bit different. And at the same time, it continues to evolve. Modern changes, as we say, every day. One of the key things that we continue to see rise to the top, though, is we see learning and development and uh, really being uh, moving from an order taker to a business partner and making sure that uh, we're taking more of a consultative approach in tying all of our efforts back to being a, a business partner and tying to those business goals. Additionally, making sure that our programs are more inclusive and accessible and that we're really putting our task at the center of our efforts of what they need in their flow of work. Um, and obviously, you know, supporting programs and making sure that we're controlling for our neurodiverse audiences and how are we balancing those that are in a remote office of or in office or a combination of the both. So when we really think of those uh, areas, we see that there's a lot of different ways that we are needing to modernize our workforce and how we're de delivering those. And as it relates to your question on what does this mean? What if we don't adapt? I think the biggest risk is that we are gonna lose out on amazing talent and ability to continue to grow our businesses. One of the analogies that I like to use is similar to real estate, where there's a buyer's market or a seller's market. And perhaps the same is true for our employment is we have an employer's market and an employee's market. And right now we're really at this crossroad where um, our talent and our employees are driving more of the consistency that we need to see in how we're supporting their needs and making sure that it truly is a mutually beneficial relationship going forward. Yeah, I just love that analogy. As a recent home buyer myself, which is his own journey, it is definitely not a buyer's market, but right now you're right, it's shifting from an employer's market to that employee in a learner's market and kind of the standards are really changing. So that is kind of a super cool analogy. And, you know, the other thing I would just think about, we hear the term modern, I think, you know, my head immediately goes to a futuristic, 
house or a futuristic, you know, style of things. But modern is really just keeping up with the times. And, and at the end of the day, I think we are catching up as the themes I heard from you, what you talked about there is we have to change and modernize from the pandemic. I think, I know we're all sick of hearing it, but it's very true. And how everything has changed from March of 2020 to, you know, March 2022, two years ago, right. it's very different. And just kept keep catching up with technology, right? It, it's an area of the business that maybe lagged in some innovation or lagged in some investment. And now we also have to catch up from that regard as well. So mm -hmm. very helpful. Well, let's take a look at the word cloud, if we could to see if there's any themes that are popping up here. Yes. Jen, any initial reactions? Oh yeah, flexible, technology, agile, digital, remote, uh, all of these. And I think, you know, it's so interesting and this is what we were talking about in the beginning is that what modern means and how to be modern for one business may not be the same for another. And so how are we taking a truly intentional approach about identifying what works for our team and what can work and move away from this? Well, we've always just done it this way. So let's keep doing it. And, and so pushing that, um, I think it's going to be really important. And, and I, as I mentioned, again, it, it then trickles down to everything that we're doing and all the actions that we're bringing forth. Yeah. It's so funny. You call it the word intentional. That was the one that caught my attention, even though it wasn't one of the big words of, you know, that really does, if we can put an intentional approach to some of the things we'll talk about soon about being learner centered and, and being able to create an, a flexible approach that works in an, an intentional way, we're really going to have some great results. And then right. the other words I would just call out is agile and flexible. Um, you, you know, one of the things learning has is a marketplace of skills and uh, skills programs that we've kind of vetted from across the, the world. Um, and one of the most in-demand skills right now is agile with the capital A or, you know, really strong project management skills and being able to be very flexible and to be able to kind of deliver that in a, in a flexible manner. So that was another interesting call out there. So with that, uh, I'm going to wrap up with a tactic that everyone here could apply to enabling a modern workforce. Again, this is the umbrella theme that you'll hear throughout the entire conversation today, but I'm going to start with, you know, a tactic that you could try tomorrow. So to start, my tactic would be to pick five people across your business, maybe one tomorrow and one every week, and really just ask them what learning and development means to them and what they need for themselves and from the organization to make that happen. You know, I, I would challenge you to pick really, there's about five generations in our working you know, employment group today in our workforce today. So try to meet with one person from each of those generations or different teams and get a different perspective on what L&D means to them and, you know, how you can help deliver that in a modern way for that group. Jen, yeah. anything you'd suggest? I love that, Michelle. And it really ties closely to the suggestion that I have is conducting an audit so look at the programs that you have, let's say your learning and development programs and one that maybe you're executing right now or just uh, completed, you know, a month or so ago and identify where there may be areas of opportunity for you to upgrade or modernize. You know, perhaps it's making it more accessible, uh, making sure you're embedding inclusion throughout, um, chunking the content so that it's easily digestible, things along those lines. Another strategy that you can do is similar to what you're talking about with interviewing um, a number of associates is asking them how they are learning today, because I guarantee you whether or not the learning and development team is pushing the information out, the, there are people on your team who are actively taking ownership and really owning and driving their own development, perhaps even on their own time. So what are the resources that they're leveraging today? Where are um, they spending their time? What newsletters are they reading? So that you can then take some of those elements and assets and repurpose them for some of your programs as well. Because we see that the greatest impact is when you provide additional support and, and resources where they're already engaging and, and what they're already using today. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I'll take us over to trend number two. Um, and where I really love about this is it's all about being inclusive and accessible. And historically, what I've observed is that learning and development and DEI efforts have been somewhat separate. DEI is something that we do on its own, they're siloed apart. And what we're really seeing the trend is that they're more interwoven. So inclusion, for example, is something that is embedded in everything that we do, all of our touch points, all of our learning programs. It's that singular thread that is woven throughout. And when we do that, it, it makes sure that we're really creating and fostering that environment that can be more inclusive. And then by consequence, it's also then more accessible. And so when we think about accessibility, what does that mean? So one example would be making sure that there are resources to our employees when they need it the most. So if they're going through and they're getting ready to have a performance discussion, how do you make sure that the resources that they may need are easily at their fingertips? Um, set, having a central location where all of your materials and, and resources and assets can be saved and available is really important as well. And so, Michelle, I know that you talk to a lot of L&D and uh, HR leaders. What are you hearing from them as it relates to this trend? Yeah, uh Good, great question, and you know, I really appreciate those initial initial comments because this is such an important topic. You know, so I think you know a lot of the the conversations start with these L and D and HR leaders about who we're upskilling across the organization, who are the people taking the programs, who are the people learning. But we like to, you know, in these conversations, we're starting to flip that. Who is not learning? Who is not taking advantage of the programs and the offerings that we have? And there's two major barriers to learning, and that's time and money. Mm -hmm. And if you take a step back, you can make some pretty educated guesses about who's not learning within your organization based on those two barriers. From a time perspective, you know, if they don't have space in, during their workday to actually learn, you know, there's a lot of people who don't have much free time outside of the work. These are mothers, you know, or stay-at-home fathers. These are people who, you know, really have to be caretakers of parents. Maybe they have religious commitments or health issues that don't allow them to have extra time to learn because a lot of, you know, these external programs are, you know, a commitment. They're seven to 10 hours a week of extra work, unless they're within your work day. That's a, it's a big barrier to entry for a lot of people. And then you talk about money. So, you know, you know, we think a lot about, you know, we're both talking about what are some internal programs that you can run, but also continuous skill building is something that can be done in extra time or, you know, through external programs. And when you think about most tuition reimbursement programs are set up as a reimbursement process, which yes, it's a great benefit. However, there's a ton of your workforce who may not be able to front the cost of a $2,000 to $5,000 program. So, you know, one of the things we're doing is helping companies flip that from a reimbursement to a prepayment. So just a few interesting things we're hearing from, from the market and, you know, just would kind of continue to say, I was at a conference in Atlanta in, in February, which I had to get used to wearing real pants again and you know, put on heels. And that was a whole thing in itself, one learning. But the other big learning was, was really about, you know, the conversation around DEI has been getting great talent and that building that pipeline, which is always going to be a super important priority for businesses as it should. But now we need to continue that conversation. It's not just about getting great people in the door. It's about developing that talent for leadership and long-term success, because, you know, when we get those individuals who bring such a balanced, diverse background, that's how big change is going to happen across an organization. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. When I think about different strategies and actions that we can take to really hit on this, one of the examples that I love is, as I mentioned, performance discussions. Um, so annual performance reviews or biannual performance reviews. Oftentimes we hear teams and organizations, you know, the, the learning management system pushes out the notification. You, maybe you mentioned it at a town hall and, you know, time to, to have those reviews and here's the documents. But instead, perhaps what we could do is create a landing page 
um, that has what are all of the scheduled upcoming live events where maybe new managers or new employees can get information about what is the process like, what are some frequently asked questions, what are the expectations, et cetera. Then also on that landing page, house some on-demand content, whether it's a cheat sheet of how to provide specific feedback or an infographic on ways in which you can minimize bias or be aware of some of the biases that you may be carrying as you're going into those performance discussions. And then the last piece that you may house on this uh, resource page could be a list of subject matter experts that the team members can go and consult with one-on-one to get that peer-to-peer support of, hey, I'm getting ready to have you know, a perhaps contentious conversation with an associate to give feedback, can I do a role play with you? Um, right. You know, and that's something that's, you know, often in my last role that I worked very closely with the HR business partner to kind of role play and practice through that if I was ever in that type of situation. And so when we aggregate those resources, it, it really makes it accessible for them when they need it most, which is when they're getting ready to have the performance discussions, not the six months before when they first heard about the new program that rolled out. Absolutely. Yep. Spot on. And my tactic uh, for you to apply is to really hold yourself and ourselves accountable through data. And, you know, if this is not an exercise that you you could do tomorrow, right? Be able to look at the data of who in the company is actually learning and then flip it of who's not learning. That's a, you know, a good sign of a, maybe somewhere you could invest in the business of being able to measure that, the, you know, the success of who's learning and who's not learning. And then you can build campaigns to really optimize for, for the, who's not learning and how you can bring up, you know, the organization as well. Mm-hmm. So with that, drum roll, please. We're going to try number three, moving forward here. So this is beyond the one and done. So as we were discussing with Jen, I'm actually going to pass it right back to you because this was a trend that you brought up. And I'm curious, like, how do you, how do you define beyond the one and done? And what does that mean to you? Yeah. So um, essentially Historically for L&D, we have been focused on creating a single course or a single program. But what we know through the research is that learners are finding ways to learn daily, weekly, and oftentimes on their own. And whether or not L&D is pushing that information out. And if we kind of take a step back from that and think about the last thing that we learned outside of work. And what was that experience like? So maybe you watched a YouTube video or you read an article or consulted with a neighbor or a friend, um, or you went to a uh, consulted Google and and looked up, you know, frequently asked questions on something to really dive into to a specific uh, area where you wanted to learn more. And the likelihood is, is that when you were really upskilling yourself on whatever it is you were learning, you leveraged all of those tactics in one way, shape, or form over the course of a period of time. And what we call that for the learning cluster design is a learning cluster. Essentially, it is this means in which you can surround your learner with meaningful assets, both in and out of the flow of work. And I think that that's when we think about moving beyond one and done, that's what we're meaning is it's not just about this one single touch point or one single tactic course or program that we're going to execute, but how are we giving them multiple assets in order to support their development and to drive lasting impact? Yeah. Awesome. I'm hearing this kind of tone more and more that learning is not an event, it's a journey. Um, so I'd love to kind of move forward to the next slide and kind of show you some of the ways that we think about, you know, representing this as well. So there are all these key moments of learning in, in your career, in your job, in your role, and it starts with onboarding, then you get a new project assigned, and then you have a key initiative and, you know, how do you prep for that next role and then promotion. It's not represented on here is those performance reviews, right? So there's all these key moments of learning. And as you mentioned, like, how can we package things beyond just 
one single asset, to, but to make that journey constant and you can always continue evolving. Because I was thinking about the times I was learning Spanish for a quick moment, as you mentioned, and yes. all of a sudden you take one class and then you forget it, you know, an hour later. It needs to be that continuous learning. So now we have an engagement moment again for you all. Um, we call these academies within learning. Learning cluster calls them learning clusters. Some people call them general programs. I'm curious for everyone listening here today, do you have or are you building an academy or insert your title there at your company? I'd love for, we would love for you to comment in to the open text form with like, what academies are you building and what's the duration, right? To see what are some of the links that you're building out. Is it an onboarding academy? Is it a sales training program? Is it leadership? Is it new manager? Those are just a few I'm hearing from the market. Um, I, or like a, you know, being able to change roles from customer success to product management for some example. Are there any job roles that you are all, or any job programs that you're all seeing? I don't know if we want to, pull up the open text and we can kind of react live to this. Not yet. Seeing if there's any. All right, for some of the people saying yes or not exactly, you know, feel free to, you know, jump in more if there's like, hey, yeah, we do have a six month leadership program or onboarding program, HR Academy, two months, okay. Eight month leadership academy and onboarding. Super interesting. Okay. I love the onboarding academy. Yeah. And these are great examples. I can share one of the action for those of yeah. you that are saying, hey, not we're not, not there yet. Um, and this is again a very top line way in which to bring it to life. But when we think about moving beyond one and done events. Um, essentially, what we talk about with the learning cluster design model is we break out the types of assets into three categories, your formal events, your immediate events, and then your so social touch points. Mm -hmm. So what that may look like. So let's take, for example, you are an in internal learning and development team, and you are partnering with an external vendor to come into your organization and perhaps coach your managers on communication styles. And so that program may be a six week program. And in and of itself, it, it will be a learning cluster. But what you can do is then overlay that to really customize it for your company. So you have that formal event where there may be live programs that, that your um, participants are going to go through. And then when you think about the in immediate components, it's how are we having recordings of those sessions? How are we having cheat sheets with frequently asked questions, job aids to jump to a specific topic on communication style? And then the final piece is that social component. How are we leveraging peer-to-peer -peer collaboration to really practice what we're learning and process what we're learning? And so that could look like maybe a monthly meeting or a peer-to-peer -peer buddy system where they kind of kind of hold each other accountable. And so when you bring all of those three elements together, both the formal, the immediate, and the social, as it relates to the, the LCD model, it again allows you this opportunity to surround them with those assets. And it's something that you can overlay to an existing program that you're maybe buying off the shelf. Awesome. Great tactic, great things that people can apply right away. You know, I'll just kind of wrap up this one with thank you for all the results. I think that, or all the, the feedback here, some really great programs. I think this could be a good thing for us to kind of clean up and share with the group as a follow-up, but seeing lots of leadership academies, lots of onboarding, and they range from one month to, I saw 18 months in there, which is a great to kind of turn that into a journey. Um, and so my tips are, if you have none today, there's a ton of no responses to it is okay. You can start doing this in small ways. I think phase one is just organizing, find all the assets together in one place, put them in a folder and give people access to that folder to kind of self-service model. Phase two is really to analyze what are all the assets you have today? What needs to be updated? Where are there skills gaps that aren't covered? 
And then phase three is really to orchestrate that into turning it into from events into a learning journey. So you can, could use a tool like LearnIn or LCD to bring everything together to really create that user experience that simple, curated, customizable, and measured, and has those layers of formal social uh, learning. We'll move on to trend number four. We're moving through. Yes. So to open this, a uh, question that I have for each of you, how many paid subscribers are on Netflix today? And essentially, there's a lot. Uh, it's over 222 million. That is a lot of subscribers. And what is really cool about Netflix is the level of customization that they provide to each one of those 220 million subscribers, which brings us to trend number four, which is learner-centered solutions. And essentially, this is a nice piggyback off of moving beyond one and done events and a segue into moving beyond one size fits all learning. One size fits all doesn't work. And in the case of Netflix, what's so unique about their platform is that not only are they curating content that's very specific to the, the viewer there. So me as someone who loves apocalyptic movies and musicals, I get served those types of movies and documentaries more frequently than you who may be more interested in documentaries or rom-coms or sci-fi. And what's the other interesting thing that Netflix does is the customization of the artwork that you see promoting specific movies or TV series. So there's anywhere from five to 20 different visuals that they may use for a single movie. And the reason for that is, is because behind the scenes, they're using the algorithm and the AI in order to identify what are the shows that you're binging? What is making you click on specific uh, details and, and making you stay and maybe continue to watch? And then using that to then serve up relevant content for you. So what does that mean for us in L&D? You know, we have, in most cases, not 220 million uh, people who are trying to solve for, but when we are wanting to create programs that are very learner-centered, the key is really identifying, and we call these personas with a learning cluster design model, is really understanding what are those learner-to-learner -learner differences and how can we provide assets, both learning clusters, um, as well as solutions to help those specific learners in their flow of work and making sure we're customizing our solutions to support them on the job. So Michelle, what are you hearing um, as it relates to this trend? Yeah, I'm hearing two trends that are super interesting around this learner-centered solutions. It's like from a CLO and a head of HR perspective, it's like, how can we create a solution that benefits our employees, but also benefits the employers, right? The employers are the ones that are funding these programs. They're the ones that have that skills gap and need that we need to close. But the employees need to have this unique and customized experience for themselves to have that, you know, to, to drive that behavior and actually taking these programs and then ultimately drive the outcomes like retention, like engagement, like true increase in productivity because you've increased skills. So there's this whole group of, of companies that are now issuing learning stipends. So it's kind of a modernized approach to you know, the tuition reimbursement, tuition assistance programs that exist today. But the stipends are a way of saying, you know, I've got one company that I, you know, work closely with that gives everybody $3,000. And they say, you know, we want you to own your own development. And that's a very common, another theme I'm hearing all the time is allowing employees to really take the wheel of where they want to go in their careers. And so what they do is they give them a marketplace of options for them to learn. Some are very short, some are longer, some are day-long boot camps, some are 12 month programs, some are university degrees, but it allows everyone to be, to customize their approach based on their time commitment, based on their, their 
approach that they like to take for learning and kind of how what, what how they think they need to to grow in their own professional careers. So of course, both the company and the employees, we recommend they meet with their managers to kind of figure out what they're going to learn. So it syncs with the business, but it's a super interesting option um, to give people various uh, various ways that they can learn. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, one of the things that came up when we asked the group about academies was onboarding. And that's actually an example here of really creating learner centered solutions. I've talked to a number of organizations and even in in my past organizations, we had a one size fits all onboarding experience that no matter if you were new to the organization, an internal transfer, a seasoned professional or a new grad, the experience was the same. And, uh, and, and sometimes there were variances and oftentimes there are variances based off of the specific job and role piece. Mm-hmm. But one thing that we can do when we're creating learner centered solutions uh, for an onboarding program is identifying where are those common differentiators and okay. how can we curate and provide materials that perhaps everyone has access to all of the onboarding Uh, curriculum that's there, but we highlight and we really rise to the top the pieces that may be the most relevant for that group. So for example, a new grad may need to have more focus on business language terminology, the business acumen piece, whereas a seasoned professional may not have to have that. Somebody who is new to the organization needs to understand the core values and the mission and the overall business objectives as a whole, but someone who's an internal transfer to a team doesn't necessarily need to go into that same level of depth. Um, So those are ways in which we can really work to customize that program for our learners and and design with them in mind. Yeah. Awesome. And I'll leave with two quick tactics to, to apply. I think I would just double down on your, your term of audit before go ahead and audit the learning options within your business. First of all, say, how easy is it to find various learning options? How easy is it to find what the policies are? I saw one comment in that in in the open text field around you have a program, but it's not marketed well. So that's, you know, an area that we can really tackle as well. Um, So audit it to see how many people or how many different options you have for different, you know, learning approaches as well. And then finally, like as you're building cohorts of employees or these programs, don't forget the big cohorts. Great, but work on sub cohorts to really get people in groups of four or five people to create that really personalized, you know, approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Michelle, before we go to the next trend, we actually had a question come through that I think we can dive into in the midst. And so the question was, is there a best practice that you've found for building and social events into academies for employees who have time barriers, especially with work-life balance, plus client calls, team hurdles, HR required training, et cetera, to make sure that the social tactic is learner-centered? Great question. And I think that what I have seen in in ways in which we've integrated social learning into the academy has made making sure that it those social experiences immediately have impact on the job. And so I'll give you an example of that. And we'll actually touch on it next in in one of the um, actions for this next trend coming up. But when you create an environment where you're wanting subject matter experts to collaborate and really work as a sounding board, creating and scheduling those social events so that it is to solve a hurdle that they have. And so in in essence, what you can do is instead of having the team hurdle be about what is our objectives for today, what is on our to-do list, what do we need to tackle, use that time for social learning to say, hey, you know, we are having some pushbacks from our clients and um, we need to identify how we can solve some of these questions that they may have. Sue, what has worked for you? What are you using or what? where have you um, aggregated information to, to kind of 
dispel any concerns that the client may have. So you're using those opportunities and perhaps embedding the social learning into already existing meetings. Um, And so that's, you know, it comes down to prioritization and making sure, you know, how we're spending our time needs to be um, really thought out well and and strategic. And so sometimes that means leaving asynchronous work to be asynchronous and, and have those meeting times truly for that collaboration and that social aspect. Great. Thank you for the question from, from Kelly. So with that collaboration leads us to trend number five, we'll kind of buzz through this one just because it's a little self-explanatory, but I want to move quickly kind of to the tactics of being a collaborative and crowdsourced organization and and developing a learning style, you know, first thing I'll just kind of react to this is like, this will always be an important priority for us as a business, but it's something I'm continuing to hear. And there's more and more tools to make this possible. Um, You know, and as I talk with learning leaders, as they're ready to design a program or academy, sometimes they forget that the best teachers are you know, right under their nose, right? It is people who have been there for a while. They're looking for ways to step up and lead. And, you know, they say once you can teach something, it's when you fully learn it as well. So challenging that you've got great, great teachers and instructors right in your own teams that you can tap on. Jen, any, any thoughts here before we move to the tactics? Yeah, this one gets me every time. It's all about collaboration over competition. It's not an us versus them. You know, we got to let go of our ego and say, you know, it's actually what does the business need? What do our learners need? And and how can I tap into other people to be more agile to produce content? And and I think one of the um, action items that we wanted to talk about is we saw great success in a program that I launched where we had subject matter experts that was pushing content down to um, a group of of learners and Mm -hmm. and they were doing so via email and so it was great we were already leveraging crowdsourcing but the weight of that was heavy on those few subject matter experts and instead what we did was we flipped the script we moved that collaboration outside of email we put it in microsoft teams and we empowered those that are on the front line to say hey when you hear something say something, you know, so if you're hearing a trend that's happening with this retailer, for example, because we were focused with retailer specific experts, let us know if if you're hearing that pricing is changing or their uh, retail media network programming is going to be rolling out a new program. And what that allowed us to do was to leverage those people who are on the front line to create content, to disseminate the content and make sure that everything's really accessible and and it lessened the load and at the at the end of the day what it also provided was a great amount of information for the LD team to then tap into when they wanted to create more formal learning opportunities for the teams yeah awesome and i'll just end with my tactic of don't forget about the moments of learning that show up in everyday work so This example came up yesterday, so I thought it was relevant. Uh, There was an employee who asked me about how to use a certain feature of the tool. And instead of responding in a direct message to him, this was in Slack, but could be Teams, could be emails, and just giving him the quick answer, I had a sense that more people would have that same question. So I used a screen capture tool. Now Slack has it. I'm sure Teams does too, where you can just record a voice recording. And I captured a one-minute video explaining the answer, but then also the context to the answer. And then I sent it to the team in our overall Slack channel. And then I dropped it into our team resources file as well. So it's a, it's just a very simple way. It took me no extra effort, but I turned it from a one-to-one learning moment to a one-to-many. So that's just a quick example of how to be collaborative. It's perfect. Yeah. All right. Our last one, trend numbers. Number six. So the final one is to be adaptive and progressive. And so what does that mean? You know, when we think about being adaptive, it's really being flexible to changing situations. And I tell you what, each of you on this call have been very adaptable the last two years. Well, going through a pandemic and working through all the changes of what it means to be at work, show up for work and show up for our talent 
you know, that is something that we will continue to see. And everyone truly stood up to that and, and, and met that challenge. When we think about progressive, it's about identifying and taking a, a tiered approach to how we are really moving to enabling this modern workforce and enabling modern learning. We cannot boil the ocean and we will never be able to boil the ocean. But what we can do is take very specific steps to move in the right direction. And I think that's what's so great about um, this final trend is really taking in that professional development lens of not only are we empowering it for our associates, but we're empowering it for ourselves as well. But Michelle, what are you hearing um, as it relates to this trend? Yeah, great, great thought here. I think that's that's really what it comes down to is prioritization. Uh, we could all sit here, we could do another word cloud about all the other things we have on our plate. I mean, just to talk through Kelly's question here, we have to do client calls, trainings, we have to do this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, what is prioritized is what gets done. And creating that modern, adaptive, progressive workforce is really what's going to need to happen. And, you know, those pre-pandemic -pand solutions aren't going to really be relevant in the future, right? So I'm all about efficiency. So I was just going to say, as you're prioritizing this as a business, like encourage this to be a topic that your team focuses on, but be efficient, borrow ideas, start small as you just talked, and then really set up that ideal team to get it done. So with that, you know, Jen, what are some of the things you're seeing in building that modern learning team? Yeah. So, you know, if I were to build the perfect modern learning team, I think the the team members would have a number of different skills and capabilities, but essentially it boils down to four key capabilities. And the first is, you know, a learning strategist, you know, making sure that you have a, a leader who can really tie back to business impact and make sure that we are key on what are our performance objectives. And this is uh, a term that we use with the learning cluster design model is a strategic performance objective that then ties back to business impact. I think that's really, really key for us. The second then obviously is a learning designer who is gonna come in and make sure that they're building programs that are inclusive with the learner in mind, learner-centered solutions, moving beyond one and done events, et cetera. The third is something that I think it came up in one of the topics and it's near and dear to my heart is marketing and communications. Mm -hmm. We spent all of this time building amazing programs and then we send one email out to talk <laughs> about it. How about we leverage some marketing and communication skills to disseminate that and, and have multiple touch points to remind our learners that these resources are available to them, how they can continue to practice on the job. And then the fourth and final piece is how to have a data analyst. So now more than ever, we are tying our efforts back to business impact. And in order to do that, we need to know what are the key performance indicators that we should be looking at and how are we going to drive that impact and how are we going to measure it? And so making sure that we have all of those components, whether it's in-house or tapping into outside consultants to, to support us is really key. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I think another topic you and I could do a whole uh, webinar on is marketing our learning oh, programs that we yeah. had. That would be very fun. Uh, it would. We just launched an initiative where we focused almost solely on the marketing communications and we had over 50% engagement of the entire company in the first two weeks. Wow. It was really cool, but that's atypical, but because we focus on that portion. So with that, you know, we thought we'd kind of leave you with our own personal development tactics. Um, I can kind of kick off and then pass back to you, Jen, around what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it's, we talk all day about training other people and help giving them development opportunities, but we ourselves need to keep fresh. So, you know, my personal learning tactics, like I'm always looking out for opportunities to learn first and foremost. So, you know, anytime I try to take my dog on a, a walk every single day, at least 30 minutes, and I'm always picking a learning podcast, right? Uh, or, or something that something is educational to my own role. And it's the time where I just have the time to focus on that because if I try to do it while multitasking, 
I'm not going to really retain the information. So yeah. when all I have to do is focus on walking and listening and, you know, making sure my dog doesn't run away, that's a really good time for me to learn. And podcasts are getting better and better by the day. Um, I also print out great resources. So I'm a very visual learner. So you could hear my papers ruffling. And I'm sorry about that. But essentially, you know, being able to actually highlight, digest, that's how I learned that I personally digest the most information. And then I kind of save it in my own folder and then really kind of come back to those resources when I need to. Um, and that, you know, in turn of, instead of a reading it as an event, it turns into a journey in a, in a way to use our term there because I'm always resurfacing it. And then, you know, <laughs> one of the benefits of all these vendors out there is they're now offering tons of webinars or boot camps, et cetera. Um, so there's some actually some really interesting ones that I've been attending. There's like one every Tuesday that talks about a different, um, different topic in customer success. And it's a really good way to continue, continually learn. And they build in, you know, experts from, from the organization. So that's another way of committed to learning as well. So Jen. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So I essentially create uh, my own learning cluster. And so the first, when I think of formal learning events, I set aside a budget, not only for what my company will pay for, but for what I will self-fund uh, to do a formal event, whether it's going to a conference or taking a course, as well as my book budget. Um, I'm a big reader, so I try to have at least one new book a month. Sometimes it's just once a quarter. Um, so I really focus on that first. The second is the immediate. I'm constantly on LinkedIn and, and uh, leveraging my RSS feed to pin articles. And so I set aside 15 to 30 minutes a day to really dive into those so that I can kind of keep up to date with what are other people talking about? What are some topics that I want to dive into? And then as it relates to the social aspect, um, I actually joined a community of other learning and development thought leaders, the talent development think tank. And I've been part of that community for over a year now. And it has been immensely helpful to be able to step outside of, particularly when I was on the corporate side in an internal L&D team, not on the consultant side, getting perspectives from others outside of my organization and seeing how they're solving problems and, and working through um opportunities for to develop their team has been really, really helpful. And so I think when you kind of round out all of those pieces, it, it helps to make sure that we continue to grow and, and develop on personally. And in order to do that, we, um, in order to support the development of others, we've got to support the development of our, ourselves as well. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Jen. Well, with that, let's go to the last slide just to kind of wrap up the day. I think this is all the trends put together, modern workforce at the top, you know, being inclusive and accessible beyond the one and done, learner-centered solutions, being collaborative and crowdsourced and adaptive and progressive. So these are just things that we're hearing from our conversations with learning and HR leaders. And so always curious to hear more. Um, I think some of the, if we had our own word bubble from today's chat, you know, I heard the term flipping the script a lot. I heard the, you know, the term listening and asking good questions and hearing what your, your team actually needs, because now it is an employer employee's market instead of an employer's market and being able to adapt to that. And then I heard the word data a lot and modern. So, you know, very exciting to kind of see some of those things. So with that, let's do just the last page, the last slide here. I'm going to pass to Jen to wrap up if you have any more, more, you know, closing thoughts here, but our emails are on here. If you have any questions um, that you want to ask or ideas and trends that you're hearing, I'm always curious to hear what's happening in, in, in your neck of the woods. So with that, Jen, anything you'd like to wrap up with? Yeah, definitely. Well, and happy to connect. Um, always looking for more to collaborate and, and grow and learn together in this space. Um, I think the one thing that I'd leave you with is just identify one thing that you want to take from this session today and apply. Um, I'm a big uh, James Clear of Atomic Habits, and his quote is, you know, if you just focus on being 1% better every day, in a year's time, you'll be 30% uh, better at whatever you're working on. And I think those are pretty good odds, you know, and so it really compounds when you continue to focus on that development. 
And so one thing I did see a question come in, uh, Michelle, I think you mentioned podcasts. I actually pulled up all my podcasts that I, I'm also a podcast junkie. Uh, so I'll go first and then you can share yours, but my, um, not always listen is the talent development hot seat with Mm -hmm. Andy Storch. I'm also a Huberman lab fan talks about the brain science of how we do things. And then of course, Brene Brown. Brene Brown. I knew you were going to say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Can't go wrong with Brene Brown. So that's, that's awesome. A lot of mine I listen to are more on the the customer success. So gain, grow, retain, if anyone's interested in that. Uh, But I also like to listen to like HR happy hour is a good one. Um, Also with Adam Grant, the work-life podcast that he has. So those are some of the ones I listen to. So there's, there's some really good ones out there and comment if you have any that you love, because there's always a walk to take oh. with my dog and always a podcast to listen to. So many. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Great. Well, Any Jen and other- Michelle, we want to thank you for joining us today. And just a reminder to our HCI members, today's webcast has been approved for HRCI and SHRM credit, as well as for HCI recertification. Your credits for attending this webcast will soon show up in your My HCI profile under the transcript tab. And while you're there, don't forget to check out hci.org for even more insights, as well as information on our certifications, virtual conferences, premium membership, and more. I want to say one more thank you to our presenters today, Jen and Michelle, and to the good people at LearnIn. And I'd also like to thank you, our webcast viewer. Thanks for spending an hour with us, and we'll see you next time.